Many words have been used by military historians to describe the communist forces of the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese Army in their war for control of the US-backed South Vietnam. Tenacious, fierce, deadly. But one word that almost always gets put into any list of such words is elusive. Unlike more conventional conflicts with an established front line, Vietnam was an area war where patches of the countryside were controlled by one side or the other. Intruding in the communist-held zones, US forces found themselves fighting an enemy that seemed to be able to strike out of nowhere, like ghosts, sometimes from even within their own defensive perimeters. The Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese army were able to achieve this through a mix of the dense jungle, which could conceal their movements between fortified positions and the construction of intricate, sprawling tunnels that as well as hiding them from US aircraft also provided protection from bombing and artillery, and even allowed them to infiltrate American bases. Given the wide-scale use of such tunnels, the US and their allies engaged in the war in Southeast Asia in the mid-60s to early 1970s required some sort of response. In this video, we are going to explore the story and experiences of the Tunnel Rats, one of the most dangerous and psychologically taxing jobs of the whole Vietnam War. Welcome to Wars of the World. We all know that the internet can be a bit of a battlefield, and we can all do with a helping hand when we're online. Today's video sponsor Aura is a fantastic way to keep all of your information safe, as well as providing a number of other services. Once you go online, a fair amount of your personal data will be available to anyone who knows where to look, which could include your location, your phone number and more. Aura is able to find the data brokers selling your information and send a request to them to remove it, a legal requirement that not everyone has the time to request. Aura can help keep the rest of your family safe with parental controls, an antivirus, identity theft insurance, and more. This means you can manage your security online from one app, and you don't need to download multiple apps to do the same thing. It's also all included in one affordable price. But luckily for our viewers, Aura is offering a 14-day free trial, so you can try it out for yourself. You can either surrender and let other people continue to exploit your personal information, or you can go to aura.com forward slash wars of the world to start your free trial today. Let Aura do the heavy lifting so you can learn more about the secret mission to bring Nazi scientists to America by watching this video. Digging in. By the time the United States became directly embroiled in the battle for the future of Vietnam in 1965, Forces both local and foreign had been in a near-continuous state of war for the southern East Asian land for over 25 years, including against the French and Japanese empires. An entire generation of Vietnamese had grown up not knowing peace, but instead knowing how to use the jungle and the land to evade their enemies when they were in pursuit, or alternatively to set traps for him when he was the one in retreat. Fighting the old empires taught the Vietnamese one valuable lesson that they could never forget, and that was that to stand their ground was in all but the most exceptional of cases, akin to suicide. Being an agricultural people, they had little in the way of matching the armor, aircraft, and artillery of the imperial powers, except their cunning. Initially, the dense jungle itself offered a high level of concealment, but overwhelming firepower could lay waste to large swathes of it, and kill anyone unlucky enough to get caught in the bombardment. What the Vietnamese people needed was a way to not only conceal themselves, but be protected from these bombardments as well. This naturally led to the digging of underground tunnels, which offered both of these needs. Construction of the tunnels was mostly commonly undertaken during the monsoon season, between May and September, when the ground was softer from the heavy rainfall. As the tunnels then dried out, they became extremely tough, as much of Vietnam's soil structure contained clay and iron which formed to create a cement-like binding agent, reinforcing its circumference. At first the tunnels were small affairs, offering protection and respite for small groups of Vietnamese troops, 
But as the fighting went on, the tunnels were expanded, not just in size, but in complexity. In some areas, several tunnels were combined to create a sprawling underground network where the Vietnamese troops could plan, train, rest, store supplies, receive medical treatment, and in the case of the communist troops, undertake political education seminars. These tunnels were a major factor in the defeat of French colonial troops in the pivotal battle of Dien Bien Phu in 1954, where the tunnels allowed the movement of supply of artillery and mortars, which rained down on the besieged French, pounding them into a humiliating defeat that spelled the end of French rule in the region. Following French withdrawal, Vietnam was left split in two, with the Communist North and the pro-West South Vietnam divided on the world map along the 17th parallel. However, the division was not so neat in reality, and thousands of people were uprooted from their ancestral lands to live in their preferred nation. But in the South, many communists chose to stay and fight the South Vietnamese government, who they saw as mere puppets to the Imperial West. This gave birth to the guerrilla army known as the Viet Cong. For the members of the Viet Cong, fighting the South Vietnamese government was simply business as usual, since many of them had a wealth of experience already from previous conflicts. Again, they resorted to their underground tunnel network for protection, particularly as with American assistance, the South Vietnamese army introduced a significant new threat, helicopters. The French had used helicopters in the region during the fighting in the early 1950s, but were nowhere near the scale that they were soon being used by the South Vietnamese army to fight the Viet Cong. Helicopters allowed the South Vietnamese army to leapfrog terrain, bypassing static defenses and traps laid in the jungle by the Viet Cong and attack them almost directly. When the Viet Cong then tried to utilize the old guerrilla adage of if attacked, retreat in the face of superior firepower, the helicopters could load their troops back up and leapfrog ahead of them again. Helicopters changed the rules of the game, and this made the tunnels even more important to the Viet Cong and their supporters from the north. Thus, by 1965, the Viet Cong were well prepared to face off against the US who they saw as just the next enemy to fight on the road to freedom. US leaders, meanwhile, failed to grasp the magnitude of the task they were undertaking. Many attributed French and South Vietnamese failings in the ongoing conflict as a reflection of their poor quality in fighting spirit and motivation compared to American troops. There was also the matter of just how advanced the American war machine had become in 1965. Ferrets and Rats it was not long before American troops began to encounter the tunnels with several discovered around the south capital of Saigon. However, few appreciated the scope of what they were facing, with helicopter landing zones and even bases being built right on top of massive tunnel complexes. All that changed in January 1966. Operation Crimp was intended to be a large seek and destroy mission against Viet Cong forces operating in the Binh Duong province of South Vietnam and would involve 8,000 predominantly US troops, along with members of the Australian Army. Australia being one of a handful of allied countries to send troops to assist the US. The operation was opened by an intense bombardment of the region, including from USAF B-52 bombers, before the Australian US troops went in to mop up any survivors. Entering the now charred and cratered Hobo Woods region, they found evidence of a large concentration of Viet Cong troops in the area, but no actual troops dead or alive. The operation was proving something of a bust, until that is a soldier participating in crimp, sat down in the jungle, before jumping back up with a start, having felt a rather sharp pain in his groin. Expecting to find a scorpion or other bug of some kind, he instead found a rusty nail, which in turn led him to the discovery of a hatch revealing the troops were on top of a tunnel network, which explained where the VC had gone. At first, efforts were made to destroy the parts of tunnels that had been uncovered, either through engineers planting explosives, or large-scale air and artillery strikes, which it was hoped would collapse the tunnels. However, this proved both inefficient and not altogether successful. It also denied the US forces vital intelligence that could be gathered from within them, including just how big this tunnel system was. Therefore, thoughts turned to entering the tunnels in pursuit of enemy troops, or to search for maps and documents that could shed light on the strength, 
and disposition of Viet Cong forces in the region. Torg turned to sending troops in to assess the nature and size of the tunnels, collect intelligence, or even a prisoner, and destroy the tunnels from within. Immediately, a significant obstacle presented itself, in that the average Vietnamese being significantly smaller in stature than the average American or Australian. The tunnels were made extremely narrow, just big enough for a single Viet Cong to traverse, one at any one time. Therefore, the unenviable task of going in was given to the smallest troops amongst the Australian and US force, and even then they had to leave behind much of their equipment, relying solely on a pistol or a knife for defence. Thus, the first members of the fraternity that would become the Tunnel Rats was born, although initially Australian troops referred to these men as ferrets, before they too began to adopt the former term. The tunnel complex they uncovered was unlike anything they had ever conceived of, comprising everything needed for a small army to function, leading one US soldier to liken it to the New York subway system. Finally, appreciating just how important these tunnels were to their enemy, the US began designating some of their personnel to carry out the job of going into tunnels and bunkers that they found to retrieve intelligence or prisoners and then set demolition charges to destroy them. These early rats and ferrets had to learn their deadly new trade on the job, and there were some hard lessons to be learned indeed. Very quickly, Australian teams were established, whereby pairs of ferrets worked together, comprising one experienced soldier and one rookie. The idea being that the experienced one could pass on his knowledge to his subordinate, until the subordinate was ready to have his own rookie assigned to him. Dedicated tunnel rat schools were created both in theatre and back home, although such training was often anything but formal. As well as the rather diminutive physical requirements for the role, most members being around 5 foot 5 inches tall with a skinny frame, potential rats needed two key elements to succeed, namely a keen ability to think on his feet, and secondary, an above average mental toughness. Early in the conflict, many untrained rats would fall victim to booby traps, ambushes, or would simply fall down holes into chambers below, injuring themselves, because the knowledge for the role simply hadn't been accumulated yet to prepare him. The most successful early rats had a keen eye for recognizing potential hazards, using their own initiative, and then passing that on. Captain Herbert Thornton, a chemical corps officer with the US 1st Infantry Division, who was responsible for creating specialized teams to enter, clear, and examine the tunnels in 1966, summed up what made a good tunnel rat by explaining that he had to have an inquisitive mind, a lot of guts, and a lot of real moxie in knowing what to touch and what not to touch to stay alive, because you could blow yourself out of there in a heartbeat. Soon, the tunnel rats became a fully integrated part of the war effort. A typical tunnel rat story can be found in the words of Australian draftee Jim Moret. Our training to take on the role of tunnel rats was conducted at the Army School of Military Engineering, located around 20 miles west of Sydney. The three-month course covered mine detection, booby trap delousing, tunnel searching and demolitions. Mostly what we subsequently experienced were bunker systems, often with short tunnels interconnecting key bunkers or providing an escape route to a nearby creek or ravine. Tunnel rats would search the bunkers and tunnels, pull out any enemy weapons and documents, then set them up for demolition. These systems were plentiful, and it was not uncommon for two tunnel rats attached to an infantry company to search and blow up over 100 bunkers and tunnels in a single four to six week operation. One in three of us was either killed or wounded during our tour. Somehow the mind coped with that, just as it coped with the string of horrendous and extraordinary sights and activities we each experienced. However, towards the end of our tours, we did tend to get a little nervous. There was a creeping belief your luck was beginning to run dry, and lucky charms emerged in great numbers. Tunnel Rat Combat The US Armed Forces has always prided itself on providing its troops with the best equipment available at the time, from their rifles to their body armor, right down to their socks and boots. However, in the tunnels, most of that was left behind. The tunnels were often so narrow that the tunnel rats had no choice but to discard much of it, and thus underground, a US or Australian soldier 
was broadly equal to his Viet Cong adversary, save for the fact that the latter would have a greater knowledge of the tunnel and would likely know where he could find an alley or lead his attacker into a trap. One thing Tunnel Rats realized very quickly was that even the standard issue US Army pistol of the time, the M1911A 45 caliber pistol, was too big for the task since firing such a weapon in enclosed spaces produced such a loud noise that one's eardrums would almost certainly rupture. As if deafening the rat was not bad enough, the sound could potentially carry for miles in the underground complexes, alerting enemy troops which he could no longer hear coming. The US Army did experiment in equipment loadouts for tunnel rats beginning in 1966, but often again it was left to the initiative of the men who would actually be carrying out the job. Many of them secured themselves captured enemy pistols of a smaller caliber or even brought weapons from home, but such was the darkness and maze-like nature of the tunnels that often tunnel rats would simply bump into an enemy soldier, resulting in the two of them engaging in close quarters, hand-to-hand -hand combat, often with knives or even their bare hands. Other weapons trialed in theater included sawn-off shotguns and World War II vintage silenced submachine guns. Later equipment included in the tunnel rat loadout included thin communications wires to allow him to communicate back to the troops above ground and a compass to allow him to have a better idea of his location on the surface. They often carried a gas mask to protect against poison gas traps, but many decided to leave it above ground as it could get in the way as he moved. And when he did wear it, his vision and hearing was even more impaired. As time went on, the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese army increasingly began to recognize the dangers posed by the tunnel rats and began taking more proactive steps to stop them. Various booby traps, such as punji sticks, landmines, pistol tripwires, and even poisonous snakes and spiders were employed to stop the tunnel rats from penetrating deeper underground or pursuing them as they used the tunnels to flee from superior US forces. At this point, you may be thinking that the majority of the casualties amongst the tunnel rats were sustained underground, but in fact the most experienced tunnel rats knew that the real danger was emerging from the tunnels at the opposite end. It became common practice for the Viet Cong to station a handful of men behind them to kill an unfortunate rat as he emerged, often with a bayonet through the neck. However, not even these measures seemed to be enough to stop some of the toughest and most ingenious tunnel rats. Eventually, both the aforementioned Captain Thornton and one of his tunnel rats, Sergeant Robert Batten, known as Batman to his team, proved such a danger to the Viet Cong that they ended up on a top 10 most wanted list, with only US generals placing above them. Along with new tactics, new detection devices, and new weapons, such as time-delayed bombs dropped by B-52s, which buried themselves several feet underground before detonating, making them much more effective in collapsing the tunnels. By the time of the Paris Peace Accords in 1973, which saw an end to US involvement in the war, the tunnel system didn't always guarantee safety for the communists like they once had. Legacy According to estimates by the Viet Cong themselves, the tunnel rats were directly responsible for the deaths of some 12,000 of their number through combat, demolition of the tunnels, or the capture of intelligence later used by US forces. In a single operation alone in August 1968, tunnel rats not only killed three Viet Cong, but captured 153 more. They were also responsible for the capture of thousands of tons of weapons of all kinds, although probably their most unique discovery was that of a captured American M48 tank that had been buried six feet underground and used as a shelter for a Viet Cong commander. In the US Army, there were in total around 700 dedicated US tunnel rats, of which 200 were wounded, while 36 were killed. However, these figures do not include the number of those who returned with enormous psychological hardship from their experiences in the tunnels. Paranoia and claustrophobia were common complaints amongst the members of the tunnel rats after the war. While like many veterans, alcohol and substance abuse was rampant amongst their numbers. However, it cannot be argued that their contribution to the war effort was significant, and the tunnel rats have forged themselves a place in military history 
as some of the toughest soldiers in the most demanding of circumstances. Thank you for watching this episode of Wars of the World.